<laughs> Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this presentation today. Um, I'm going to start with the first picture. The first picture, this picture, is suicide, and for me, it depicts both the suicide victim and the loved ones left behind. It encompasses the total disconnect, the irreversibility of this action by the suicide victim, and the total brokenness the survivors of loved ones of suicide feel. Their sense of powerlessness and the perceived notion that they'll never be able to mend. So my session today is really going to be dedicated to the survivors of the people that have completed suicide. And um, I'm going to have two um, interviews. First time I've ever done an interview, and it's also the first time these two very courageous people have ever been at an interview. So bear with us. Um, it, it's a very courageous thing to do. And um, the grief after suicide can be different, and it is different from other modes. And the mourning, pro the mourning process after suicide differs from death in the following ways. There is a greater need to seek explanation for the deaf and to make sense of the deaf. Survivors experience greater levels of guilt and feel responsible for the deaf, or at a minimum for a failure to somehow have not seen this coming. There is a greater level of stigma and shame about this mode of deaf and a greater need to conceal the fact that the deaf was a suicide. Survivors receive more avoidance by and isolation from the community, social support, and from their regular social networks. Exposure to the loss of a loved one to suicide increases the chances of suicidal thinking and behavior in the person exposed. And please do remember that suicide victims are not weak, selfish, or cowards. They were people. They were human beings. They were fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, brothers and sisters who were loved and who loved and were in great pain and they are missed and loved every single day. So please remember to choose your words carefully and do not judge what you possibly cannot understand. Next slide, Jill, uh, Lynn, please. Thanks. So 10 times more adult suicide loss survivors are 10 times more likely to consider suicide themselves in the initial months following a loss. This is true. Just a, a little story that I'd like to tell you. The person um, who founded Solos um, decided to start the group because she lost her husband to suicide. And two years later, unfortunately, she completed suicide herself. She couldn't cope with this loss. Um, so now we're going to go to um, the two interviews. Before that, though, I'd just like to continue by telling you that nothing, not even years of depression, addiction, mood swings can prepare a family for suicide. It is a death like none other, a violation of our most powerful instincts. But I've learned that suicide is the terrible, irreversible side effect of illness. And like cancer, is not a choice a person makes. It doesn't matter how much you love your children and family. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor, famous or not. It does not matter what race or cultural background you come from. It is a sense of utter despair and disconnect. And many times it is not wanting to die, but not wanting to live the life full of despair hopelessness and psychological pain. Now we'll go to Joanna, uh, Joanne's story and then Michelle's. Hi Joanne, thank you so much for coming on today and to allow your, and, and allowing us to ask you questions about your father who you lost in um, 2013. Yes. And um, I think it, it's going to benefit a lot of people, and I know it takes a lot of courage to talk about it. So if it's okay, I'll start with my first question to you, which oh. is um, talk to me a little bit about your dad. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank you as well, Laurie, and for Seda for allowing me to speak. Um, my dad was a, he was a fun person. He was um, jovial. He always had a smile on his face. I would, I would describe him as a clown. 
<laughs> because he would act like one. He would dance and do weird things, you know, just, just so that he could get a, like laughter going. And um, he did have his demons, unfortunately. It was um, alcoholism. And um, I think he, it, it kind of altered his thinking and he would always feel sad and lonely even though we were there. So, yeah, unfortunately, that is the major that played a role in his uh, suicide. The trigger. The trigger. Yeah. That yes. So when this devastating death happened, how yeah. did your family, the community, your friends react? Did you get the support you needed? I'm going to be honest. No. So, um, because I was in the house when he uh, committed suicide, uh, I heard everything. Um, I, was, I was blamed for everything. So instead of the community being behind me and supporting me and asking me if I'm okay, they would ask me questions like, uh, what did you do to trigger your dad? Um, what did you say to him that made him do something so you know, horrible, so terrible. And there were a few people, and that's my husband included, that on the day were being supportive. Com community, unfortunately, they would gossip amongst themselves and say that, um, you know, Joey, that was my dad, he, his daughter was at home and she was the one that was involved. So it was kind of like a broken telephone and nobody offered to actually speak to me directly or ask me directly. Must have been horrific, horrific time for you because um, this is, seems to be a common thread with people who have lost loved ones to suicide. That yes. uh, they they are judged yes. and in a very, very nasty way, um, yes. and um, so they didn't understand the terrible impact that no. that this had on you. And what role does stigma play? If um, you know, what role do you think it plays? The stigma. Um, people need to try and understand what suicide is. Um, as young as I was, I knew that suicide wasn't a cowardly act, as people would call it. And stigma, the, the stigma attached to it, people would be, um, it's, it, I feel like they were judgmental. No one really understands what the other person is going through, but instead they would just kind of gossip and think of it as such a horrible or uh, a taboo thing and no one really tried to understand what suicide is and I think that's what people need to do they, have, they need to understand what why people do the things that they do they just feel that they have too much of pain that's true and, um, yeah and that's why it's so important to create awareness all the time it's yes. so important. So tell me then, Jo, and how did you find support? Um, I had to kind of search for it. Uh, the support that I had was from my, uh, my husband, uh, my mom and my sister, and there were a few people that I didn't expect the support from. I did try going to a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm not saying don't go to a psychiatrist. It's just unfortunately they were putting me on medication and the medication would kind of numb me for a little while. And the long-term effects that that had on me is that I cannot remember a lot of things. Um, my memory kind of faded away. I, I can remember the, 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 the day it happened, but I can't remember things in between. I can't remember things before that, after that. Um, yeah. So I, I've had to kind of, speak to my husband. I tried to speak to people that were close to me. I did try to go to the psychiatrist, like I said, and a psychologist. Um, but I think I, I didn't find as much help as I should have. Maybe I should have tried a little bit harder, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but um, I found more closure with, with people that I, I trusted. Oh, I see. That yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, that seems to be also another thing that psychiatrists and psychologists, some of them do not really grasp the real meaning of what that person is going through. So 
Um, but I think it is changing. I think there's a lot of uh, very good psychologists and psychiatrists out there now. And um, I think as the awareness grows, this will change. Um, support groups, would you promote these to others? And if yes, why? Yes, I would. Um, when I first started your support group, um, what I liked was that everyone was friendly with each other. No one was judging the other person. And I think as a suicide survivor, you, you get so used to being judged. Mm -hmm. And when you go to this, to, to, to these support groups, you find su the support and the love and the, and the advice that you're looking for. So I would definitely um, promote these support groups. And this is still a very difficult journey for anyone to endure. Um, what have you done to help yourself and what suggestions do you have for people who are just starting this road less traveled? Well, myself, I've started um, exercising regularly, doing yoga, um, a lot of mind, um, I call it mind movement kind of thing, uh, breathing techniques, try to calm myself down. Um, it's not a hundred percent. I do have anxiety attacks here and there, night terrors and stuff. But, um, you know, it, it has helped me seven years later. But um, for those people who, who are just starting to go through this journey, I just want to tell them that, you know, it's not the end of the road. I know it feels so sore, so painful, but there's a life that you look forward to, your own life. I know that there is a life that has been lost, but there is a lot to look forward to in the future. So give yourself something to look forward to. Very good advice. Thank you. And experiences such as this take us out of our comfort zone totally and leave us for a time just trying to breathe and grasping to find a new normal. And look at you today. You've grown. And um, what is it that you can say has been one of the lessons that you've learned? Um, I know this may sound cliche to lots of people who never give up. I have given up more than once um you know it was such a bad seed uh it just grew it was planted into my mind and i cannot forget about it and i would give up every single day I find, like you can't do the normal things like watch it watch tv and um i try my best to just keep going to try and overcome those fears and just be myself again uh, I have changed a little bit. I've become a little more introverted than I was. But um, all these changes happen and I, I, I accept them with open arms because I'm a different person now. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for giving us a little glimpse of how your dad was because that is how you should remember him. Thank yes. you so much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Michelle. She's here to discuss her bereavement and her loss to her husband of 25 years, Philip, completed suicide 16 months ago. Welcome, Michelle, and I really do appreciate your courage. Thank you. Okay, my very first question to you is, you know, um, suicide and grief, the grief that someone experiences uh, via suicide is compounded with that question why and why didn't I see it coming and how has it been for you? Sure, it's, it's been the most toughest journey of my life. I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. I um, I think initially after Philip um, hung himself, he um, I, my, my son battled with it and I think I was so um, conscious about um, trying to help him out and get him through it that I kind of put my grief on the back burner. And so it was only this year, much later this year, during, the, during COVID, that I actually literally had a breakdown um, and um, ended up seeing a psychologist and, and taking steps to help myself cope. So, yes, no, no, I, I understand that. And uh, the other question I've got for you is the stigma attached to suicide. Has that had a bearing on you or your yeah. son? 
Yeah, definitely. Especially uh, Philip was very um, intolerant of people with depression and anxiety, and he ended up being the most anxious people I knew. So he used to think that um, people should just put a cracker up their backside and get on with it and sort themselves out. So when he hung himself, I mean, it was like unbelievable. Like, where where is this coming from? And Jesse had the same attitude as, as his dad as well. So it was trying to um, explain to people and not, and also trying to say to people now, it's okay if you know somebody that's committed suicide, you need to talk about it. And a, a very close friend of mine committed suicide four years ago. So I'd already been through that. And then I had the doubly with, with Philip. So I, I yes, yeah. kind of had an idea of what he was going through and, and, and after, the, after the suicide and that, but, uh, yeah, the, the stigma is, is always a and thing. and had did you actually have people come and make comments that were really ignorant comments like you know he was weak or selfish or how could you how could he leave you in this situation yeah and how did you cope with that well I, do, I think a lot of people also just um, think that if somebody's committed suicide. It, something happened in the family and you kind of to blame like what did you do what was going on in the household like mm -hmm. you know and um and also his his family on on his side were very ignorant about it they were mm -hmm. like how can he why did he what happened Th there must be a valid reason for him to do it mm -hmm. um philip's father died when he was 14. he fell off a windmill in the middle of the night oh. so we've never known if that was yeah. suicide as well. Yeah. So there's always been that kind of in the back of my head yeah. my whole life, but Philip never ever showed any, any signs. signs of it until he started spiraling out of con control with severe anxiety, probably yeah. eight months before he committed suicide yes. Yes. started. Yeah. So then that, that, that mental illness was actually, could have been yeah. the, the thing that triggered everything yeah. off for him. I, I don't know if, so yeah. I don't know if that's hereditary. I, 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 I haven't yeah. looked at it at that mm. time, but definitely. And he, it, Philip also wrote a lot of poetry. Mm. And his poetry was very, um, not dark, but always about loss. And I often used to say to him, like, these people think that you have quite a sad life or, yes. or what have you. And, uh, now, when I look back on it, I think, well, that's maybe that's what, what was going on in his head. I don't know. Yeah. He didn't share that with you. He didn't me. share that with mm -hmm. you. And, and um, your journey now, that you've gone through 16 months of, I am sure, of one step going forward and 100 backwards, and then just going, what on earth has happened to me? How is this really? Is this really us? Mm -hmm. How are you feeling now? And what would you say to someone who's just starting this journey? I don't know. I think you've just got to take it day by day. Um, if you overcome by grief, you've just got to go with it. I have. I still have bad days. Like bad day, I, we. I just sit and cry for like whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very disappointed that my, our future pa plans have been cut short. Yeah. We had a lot of plans that we were going to do this and travel and you know get the caravan and all that. And now I don't have that. I don't have somebody yes. with me anymore. And. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the hardest part, besides losing him and not having him around. It's like my, my whole future is uh, now I've got to re-decide what I'm going to do. Again. Yeah, and I, it's, it's, it's horrible, but uh, you've just got to. And I think get help, speak to people. Um, if you've got to take an antidepressant to get you through and help you cope, you you just got to do those things. So you do whatever you can to help yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and also don't blame yourself. It's very hard not to blame yourself. Um, to keep looking back and going, oh, if I hadn't done this, maybe if I'd said this, maybe if I'd got him into St. Joseph's three days before, that which which that was in my mind yes, because yeah. I could see he was spiraling out of control. If only I'd done that, we, we wouldn't have experienced yes. this. If only we hadn't gone to a GP and, and maybe gone to a proper professional. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's all those things. And tell me, just to end it off, uh, what is the, the best memory you have of Philip? Oh, yeah, his, uh, the way he used to mess around and joke and give people frights and um, and his generosity and also his love for me. I, I, I found a, while I was packing up my house, I had to move from the south coast back up to Hillcrest, I found a letter he had written me with a hundred reasons why he loved me. Oh. 
Um, he wrote me a lot of poetry. That is so special. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's sitting there. It's very hard so, to read. It's, it brings up, stirs a lot of memories. But he he had a very intense love for um, for for Jesse and, and and myself, and and I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that yeah, at all. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he was well, just a bit thanks, crazy. Yeah. Shall hold on to that because that is really who Philip was. Yeah. Thank you so much it's for sharing pleasure. this with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, uh, sorry, I was so engrossed in listening to the whole thing again. Um, well, I'd like just to end my little session, just to say that um, these people, the people that have lost loved ones to suicide, really do have to go through a terrible journey. And But at the end of it, if they really try within themselves to live with that pain and to make it theirs and um, they will come out of it stronger and the sun will shine again and there will be a turning point. Thank you. And I'd just like to talk about um, the solos group quickly. We used to meet once a month. We now with COVID, we can't, but we do have a WhatsApp group that people can join if they want to. It has increased during this pandemic. So, but you are welcome if you want to join and you feel you need the support. We sometimes have Zoom, at least we try and do it once a month with people that can. And other things we do is on the 10th of September, we had a pebble ceremony. Um, we had a remembrance walk virtual. The uh, video was given out to everybody. Um, there's a memory wall that SADAC did, and I think it's still on their SADAC page. And on the 22nd of November is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention National Survivors of Suicide Day. They usually send us a video, and we show it, usually try and show it at the same time or within that zone, time zone, that everyone in the world shows it. And yes, so um, if you do know of someone who needs support, please give them the Solos or SADAC number. Thank you so much for listening. Lynn, over to you. Thanks so much, Laurie. And thanks, enormous thanks to Joanne and Michelle for sharing their stories. It's really not an easy thing to do and we really appreciate that as well. So um, I just wanted to add, as Laurie said, um, to also just be aware of our um, SADAC 24-hour pre-help lines for any time of day or night. Um, I put the suicide crisis line number up there and the 24-hour number there, and it's they're really fantastic numbers to share with people as well. I've got um, my contact details there as well, but we will be in touch with everyone who's on the um webinar anywhere and share our details if you want to if you want to um i've just kind of put a given you an idea with this slide on all the different activities that we do here in kzn from advocacy and awareness to community outreach and support groups as laurie was talking about a really key focus to help people come together and talk about depression anxiety what they're going through and share their experiences so anyone who is um, new on the forum and wants information, you're welcome to be in touch with me at, at any time. But what I'd like to do now is um, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Saroshi Naidu. Um, and just to go through her bio, um, Dr. Naidu is both a qualified social worker and psychologist and has been an academic and practitioner for over 20 years. She is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Johannesburg um, and a pra practicing psychologist and has a special interest in the areas of bullying, self-harm and suicidal behavior. Um, she has published both locally and internationally in these areas. Her PhD is in the field of suicide and she tested a model of suicidal behavior in the South African context. She has worked with SADAC before and is keen to contribute to suicide prevention efforts in South African communities. So thank you so much, Dr. Nadi. We really appreciate you being with us. I'm going to um, stop my share screen now and um, let Dr. Nadi um, share her talk with us. Thank you, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so thank you, Lynn and Laurie, for inviting me. Um, Laurie, who I've worked with for many years, will tell you that I've got a very keen interest in the area of suicide 
and um, something I'm really, really feel very passionate about, both in terms of research as well as practice. So I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you about some findings from my, my PhD research, which I think um, is really very important. Um, something which I don't think I had quite realized for myself um, up until the point that I actually started doing research in this area. So I'm just, will you, if you can just give me a minute or two to, to just bring up my screen. Okay, everyone, so like I've said, um, I want to talk today about the relationship between hopelessness and suicide. Um, something which I think we all kind of think about and, you know, when somebody actually makes the decision to commit suicide, you know, we talk about how the person was feeling quite hopeless, and was feeling quite futile. And I think that it's something I've also thought about quite a lot in terms of my own work. Um, and after many years of doing study in this area, um, I decided to actually test whether that might be true, that hopelessness does in fact have a relationship with suicidal behavior. So to begin with, um, just some statistics that you already know, the number of people that die by suicide every year, that there's a death every 40 seconds. Uh, more alarming is the statistic that it's the leading cause of death amongst 15 to 29 year olds globally. And that for each adult who dies by suicide, there are at least 20 more that have attempted it. Um, that more females, make suicide attempts. The statistic that more females attempt suicide, but more males are successful simply because males tend to engage in more lethal attempts, like they will go and shoot themselves, whereas a woman is more likely to um, use a far less lethal attempt, like maybe cutting herself, and there's a big chance that she will actually survive the attempt. Um, so in my research then, I wanted to answer the question of who are the people that engage in suicidal behavior and why do they do so, okay? Um, so these then are just really some findings from my study. So ladies and gentlemen, what I did in this research was to test a theory of suicidal behavior, okay? So there is a guy called Thomas Joyner who's come up with quite a revolutionary new theory of how we can understand suicidal behavior. And for me, it represents really, you know, a kind of milestone approach. If you think about um, suicide, we know that it's been with us for thousands of years, actually. Um, and, you know, we've, we have various theories around why people actually engage in suicidal behavior. And uh, Thomas Joyner came up with this novel thinking around how suicidal behavior often emanates from thwarted interpersonal needs. So Thomas Joyner's idea is that, you know, suicidal behavior is based upon the following three premises. One, that we all have a need to belong. Two, that we must all feel that we have a reciprocal relationship with others. So in other words, we must feel like other people need us and that we need other people, right? So belongingness, we must feel like we belong. We must not feel alienated from other people. So one is belongingness, and the second one is that of fe not feeling like we are a burden to other people. And Thomas Joyner said that these are basic human needs. So in other words, you know, um, after our needs for food and shelter have been met, the next needs that we have as human beings are that of interpersonal needs. We want to feel like we can depend on people and that other people can depend on us, okay? So Joyner said then, that if we do not feel like we belong to other people, we do not have a sense of belongingness, and if we feel like we are a burden to other people, and in the presence of a third component, and that is that we must feel a sense of hopelessness about these things. So we mustn't just feel like we don't belong, we mustn't just feel like we are a burden to somebody, but that we must feel hopeless about the situation, like nothing about that is going to change then suicidal ideation will actually begin. So I'm going to show it to you here. I'm going to show you a part of the theory. So Joyner said, as you can see here, you see per perceived burdensomeness at the top and you see thwarted belongingness. So Joyner says that if you feel like a burden, you might have a sense of death ideation, like, you know, what is the point of living? Nobody would actually miss me if I were gone. If you have a sense that you didn't quite belong, 
to a social group, be it your family, be it friends, you might also feel like, oh, what's the point of it all? And, um, you know, nobody would actually miss me if I actually died. So that's a death ideation. That's not suicidal ideation because you have no intention to do anything about it. But just the feeling of, oh, the situation is, you know, I just feel like I don't even know what I'm doing here. But when you look at this next figure, right, you see what happens when hopelessness enters the picture. Okay. So here again, we have perceived burdensomeness. Again, we have a sense of, I don't belong. But suddenly when we had hopelessness, we see that the picture begins to change. Suddenly we no longer have death ideation. The death ideation begins to transform into suicidal ideation. So the feeling like, I just want to end it all, or I am going to end it all. That's suicidal ideation, a very different thing from death ideation. Okay, so, so everybody, this was really a very, very interesting finding for me, um, because like I said, you know, we all know that people must have a sense of hope, but to actually be able to test um, this theory, you know, with, actual, with an actual sample of people was actually quite, you know, quite a novel thing for me to have done, and, and it's, in, in, it's an area that I published in. So I want you to see them so in the next slide. I'm going to show you some actual statistics. So we're well, not statistics, I'm going to show you a graph. Please do not be confused by this picture. Um, I'm a researcher, so you know I do things with graphs and numbers and that kind of thing, but I'm gonna to explain to you what it actually means so that you can see for yourself that it's actually not that difficult to understand, okay? So in this, so in this graph, what you see is the relationship between belongingness, hopelessness, and suicidal ideation. And if you look at the two graphs that are going horizontally across your screen, you can see that that represents high levels of thwarted belongingness, so a high level of feeling like I don't belong, and below it is a lower level of it, right? And when you look at this, what this graph actually tells you is that you might have a sense of I don't belong, but it is only when your sense of hopelessness about that situation actually begins to increase, that you will see how the column on the left represents suicidal ideation. You can see how suicidal ideation begins to increase. So the point I'm making is that you can have a temporary sense of, I don't belong, people don't like me, um, you know, I feel like I'm excluded, but it's only when you actually feel hopeless about it that you can see that suicidal ideation begins to increase. And this, this um, research was actually done on a sample of people in the Durban area. So the actually, actual human beings like you and I, across race groups, across age groups, across ethnic, ethnicities, I found that the same thing held true for all of these people. In the next slide, you'll see that here I've got burdensomeness. And you can see that the same thing applies with burdensomeness. A person can have a sense of burdensomeness, but it is only when hopelessness enters the picture, the person feels quite hopeless about being a burden to other people that you can see how it connects with the, with, with the part on the left, which is suicidal ideation. You can see that as hopelessness about feeling like a burden to other people starts to increase, you can see that suicidal ideation began to increase. And the part of the research which I'm not presenting is that for many of these people, that hopelessness translated into suicidal ideation and went on to become suicidal, suicidal behavior. So at least 40% of that sample felt a very strong sense of hopelessness. And in many of the cases, there were at least one or two suicidal attempts. Right? which tells you that you know, we're, not just, we're, ju we're not just talking theory here, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about an actual feeling of hopelessness that makes a person feel like, I just want to end it all. Okay? That's how ho important hopelessness is, because it does not refer to a temporary situation of feeling alienated or a burden to other people, but rather a sense of this futility in the situation. Okay, so now that I've presented all of this, let's talk about why does hope matter then? Why is hope such a big thing, right? And the main reason is that hope is the thing that gives us reason to live. When we have no hope, we really have got no desire to live. 
right? When our lives feel like they're quite, like it's quite dark, we don't actually want to continue that journey, right? You know, hopeless people feel like, um, you know, they've reached a dead end. Um, they don't see any way out of that darkness. They do not see the light at the end of that tunnel. For them, all they see is this big void of darkness, which represents hopelessness. Okay, but the thing is, and the thing that we can build on, and here's the part that we can actually work with, is that hope allows people to approach problems with a positive mindset, right? If you believe that you can change a situation, you probably will be able to, okay? There are many things about our lives that can actually be changed if we, if we know in our hearts that there is hope that that situation can be changed. So to answer the question then, what can we do to help others or to help ourselves when we feel hopeless about interpersonal situations? So in other words, situations that involve other people. Usually the situation is temporary. Right? We all have fights with our loved ones. We all have relationships that end. We have friends who sometimes can turn against us. Sometimes our employers may treat us badly. Okay? You all know of a situation when Things seemed so bad. Take, for example, a relationship that ended in high school. At that point in time, you might have felt like you were never, ever going to be happy again. But look at it now, 10 years down the line, you tell yourself, oh, thank God this person broke up with me or I broke up with that person, right? But at that time, the situation felt very permanent and very dark and very hopeless to you, okay? And what he tells you, the fact that you've moved on and that you you sometimes realize it was actually a good decision for you, tells you that as human beings, we have the capacity to overcome these situations and we have the capacity to move on. We have far more resilience within us than we actually realize. And sometimes we just need to believe that we have that resilience and that we can in fact fight back, okay? I would say talking, talking directly with the person we might have that interpersonal issue with. For example, if somebody is alienating us and we feel like, you know, the situation is so hopeless, I don't know why this person is treating me in this way. Talk directly with the person. Sometimes just opening up that conversation is enough to resolve that issue. If you can't talk to that person, you must know that there's at least one person we can talk to about how we feel. It might be a parent, it might be a sibling, it might be a friend, it might be somebody we work with. And if you don't have any of those people, then talk to a counselor. There's always somebody, there's somebody at SADC, there's somebody on the suicide hotline, there's somebody at Lifeline, there is always somebody that we can talk to. Okay, know that whatever it is you feel completely hopeless about today will not seem as important in a few months or even in a few years, right? Like the example I gave you about, we've all had our hearts broken at high school, but we've moved on since then, right? And we've realized that the decision might have actually been a better one rather than the worst one for us, okay? And if you are the friend or the family member of a suicidal person, tell them this. Tell them that the situation is temporary. It will get better. You must know that it will get better. It will not, no situation con continues in, in that kind of manner for an extended period of time. They, and if you cannot, you know, change that situation of somebody treating you badly or somebody abusing you, for example, know that there are solutions to the problem, that you can walk away, that you can build a life for yourself away from that person. But the most important thing is just believing that there is hope that things will change. Changing your mindset, giving yourself a new perspective about it. And if you are the friend or the family member of someone is suicidal, it's really important that you instill that hope in them, that you let them know that however bad things might seem right now, that things will change. Let them know that you are there and you will sit with them you will hold their hand until they get, get to the other side. That is what people need. People need to have a feeling of there is some hope in the situation. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it's just igniting that spark of hope that is enough. I'm going to show you this last slide in which you can see this little flower. In this arid land, all it has been provided with is just a crack 
a little, little bit of sunshine. And look how it has grown into the beautiful flower that it is. And that's how we are as human beings too. If, if we believe that there is hope, then we can and we will flourish. Thank you for listening.